Welcome to the Money Tree Real Estate Investor Podcast, where we learn from real estate professionals across the industry. They will share about how they got into real estate, the big wins they have celebrated, the mistakes they have made along the way, and the advice they have for anyone following in their footsteps. Money really does grow on trees. Hey everybody, it's William Holland here for another episode of the Money Tree Real Estate Investor Podcast. We've got a special guest today, Adam Gower. Uh, he hails from uh, Northern England, I believe. Um, I'll go ahead and read his bio as well. So he's uh, been in the real estate industry as a veteran for over 30 years with over a $1.5 billion of CRE investment and finance experience. He helps people build digital marketing systems for professionals who want to crowdfund and raise uh, equity for investments. He has taught over 4,500 individuals how to build wealth, preserve capital, and earn passive income from investing in real estate. He has over $7 billion of experience transacting distressed real estate from major institutions and banks. You can find out more at his website, GowerCrowd.com, or simply look him up on Google, Adam Gower Crowdfunding. Hey, Adam, it's great to have you on today. William, thank yeah. you for having me. Yes, sir. Where do well, you hey, want to start? <laughs> you know, I was just telling you, um, I quit my job in January. It's been a, a fun ride so far. Uh, but as you know, the, it's the toughest environment to invest in real estate in probably 15 years. Um, so I know we were talking beforehand. I've been thinking about pausing this podcast for a few months. Um, I know you had some input on that. So I'd, I'd love tell you to why you shouldn't do that. that. Yeah, here's why you should not do that. I'm, I'm totally serious. So I don't know how you've been deciding who to have on your show. Uh, but, you know, here you are right at the end of the road and you've hit you've hit pay dirt finally <laughs> with this podcast. He said modestly. Uh, so the reason that you shouldn't stop is that podcasting actually is one of the most powerful ways to network. People who will not otherwise take your call will take your call if you invite them to come on, on a podcast. So if you were to put down, again, I, I, I don't know what you've done for your prior you know 50 episodes, but if you were to put a list down of all the people that you want to network with and to get to know they're in Dallas... Uh, to understand what's going on in the market, to find deals, to figure out some of the complexities of the industry that you don't understand. Put that list together and invite them on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And then and then what happens is you establish a relationship in the, you know, in the few minutes before you actually go live or before you start recording. Then you can ask them all the questions that you want to know through the podcast and they'll tell you it's unbelievable people will tell you things like wacky stuff that they would never ever tell you otherwise i'll give you some specific examples and then when you stop recording you can then follow up or that then you talk about what the follow-up is so i'll give you some examples specifically so i've had people when i started in digital marketing, right however long ago it was i knew nothing at all about digital marketing so I was scratching my head trying to figure out, okay, what are best practices? How do you do this? Is What's Instagram? What's Facebook? What's, how does LinkedIn work, et cetera? And so what I did was I thought, oh, I know. I'll just I'll revamp my podcast so that it's all about best practices in digital marketing. And I sent out emails to – I ran a search on Google, best digital marketers in America – I got a list. I emailed them all. Ten, I think it was 10 of them, top 10, right? I emailed them all, said, do you want to be on my podcast? And I figured, you know, I'll do 10 invitations a day. And okay. I'll probably get one out of 10. We'll say yes. And after, a, a, you know, a week, I'll have five podcasts in the bag. And I'll be able to start this new series. Well, all 10 said yes yeah. on the first day. And I'd been very careful. I had a LinkedIn a Twitter expert, an Instagram expert, a Facebook expert, a funnel expert, all these different experts. And I just asked them, okay, how do you build a funnel? What is best practices with Twitter, right? Like what are the pros and cons of using LinkedIn? And so if you actually listen to those podcasts, you'll hear me learning how to do everything I didn't know how to do from some of the top experts in the field. Now, if you're a real estate sponsor, I'll give you some examples of the kind of guests you can get that will change your life, right? It's why I strongly don't stop. You've done all the hard work. 
So let's say you want to buy, pick it, uh, you know, pick uh, any any idea. Distressed, right? right wait, anyway, I'm going to date stamp your podcast. Sorry to do that. Most of what we talk about be evergreen anyway. It's okay. It'll last forever. But August 23, 2023, markets are headed down. Uh, it, we're, we're heading into a, a tough time for commercial real estate. So one example, and you've, you've, you're have scratching your head. I can't find uh, deals, right? It's like a really tough market. It's perfect. So one thing you might start looking for is distress deals. So do a little bit of research and find out who is an expert in distress deals in Dallas, right? Might be a receiver. Uh, it could be, uh, might be a banker who's willing to talk. Uh, it could be an attorney who talks about the different kinds of deals. Might be an expert broker, right? Who's, whose specialty is distressed uh, apartment buildings, just for example. Get them on the podcast and ask them, ever, how do you find them? What are the tactics for finding? When you find one, what are the biggest challenges you have? And what's going to happen is you're going to learn. And at the same time you're learning, your audience is learning as well. But what your audience also learns is they also learn that you are becoming a an expert in that field because they're not going to listen to every single podcast, but they know that you are and that you're having those conversations afterwards. And then whoever it is you're talking to, they get to know you, you have established a relationship and they might send you deals. So it's the most amazing way to build your network. One of the most valuable ways you could possibly do it. Absolutely. Okay. No, I appreciate that. that. Sign off. What? I was just going to say, I appreciate that. You know, the podcast is definitely my favorite thing that I do. Just building connections and hearing people's stories. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is that people will not otherwise talk to you. Can you imagine you call, let's say you call the CEO of a, of a major company uh, that you want to do business with for some reason or a receivership. If you were to call them or send them an email, Hi, you know, I'm uh, I'm William Holland here. And uh, can I, do you mind getting on the phone with me for an hour so I can ask you all the most you know, like key things so that I can run my business better? <laughs> Obviously not. But if you say, hi, I'm William Holland and uh, I'd love you to be on my podcast. You're an expert in such and such a field. Would you be on my podcast? Boom. Yes, of course they will. Right. And you'll get me, a lot of people will ignore your emails, but there'll be those that will, come on to your show and then you ask them i'll give you another example of exactly what i mean so i had uh um i've had people on my show who have been running really exceptionally effective uh, uh crowdfunding campaigns on their own platform and i asked them okay what marketing strategies do you use that work the best and they tell me it's so cool. So now I know, okay, yeah, I never thought of, you know, TikTok, right? I'm just mm -hmm. pulling that out my head. But TikTok advertising, if you're going after non-accredited investors, don't think of that. All right, tell me more. How do you do that? How do you do what how did you discover that? What are the hazards of doing that? What are the costs of doing that? What kind of advertising? Uh, how do you harvest names on TikTok? And they'll tell you everything because it's actually really interesting. They're an expert. So suddenly you go from not knowing to discovering something and learning how to do it really well. Mm -hmm. TikTok, for example, but that's that's how you should use podcasts. That's what that's the that's how you should leverage podcasts is so you can learn what it is that you want to learn. And don't be embarrassed. I've asked all kinds of stupid questions on podcasts. Yeah. I look back and oh my god, what was I thinking? Right to ask that kind of question. But hey, guess what? Now I learned something from it. And now I've become an expert in that. So now people come to me and they ask me, teach me about that aspect of marketing, for example. Yes, sir. I love that so much. Passive investors in real estate are able to receive a check every month. Some people call that mailbox money. We say money really does grow on trees. Visit the website at biggerpictureholdings.com where we have a ton of free resources to help you learn more about planting your very own money tree. Well, let's dive in a little bit more into the real estate. So you mentioned distressed commercial real estate. So I'm, I'm here to learn. Uh, what what can you teach me about how to find distressed real estate? You know, who are the people I need to talk to? You already mentioned a few 
uh, different avenues and relationships to build. But how did you become an expert in that that area? Oh, OK. So, um, OK, so if you're going to let me do any pitching, just let me know and I'll I'll pitch a little something, you know, I yeah, want go to ahead, go ahead. All right. So I'll do that. But then I will tell you how I got into how, how I learned about distressed uh, real estate. So I just wrote another book. This is my pitch. So anybody that wants, you know, to go off and get a sandwich or something uh, doesn't want to hear a pitch. Now's a good time to do that. Hang on a minute. I need some water. Uh, so I just wrote another book. It's called The Reality of Distressed Real Estate. It's a, it's $7. If you don't like it, just tell me. I'll send you your $7 back. Uh, but it's on my website, uh, gowercrowd.com. It's on the first homepage. Uh, and uh, it has it has the answer to your question, what is distressed real estate in considerable detail? And it is based on my experience of distressed real estate. And I'll explain where that came from briefly. So I am uh, a lot older than you. <laughs> and uh, I started uh, in commercial real estate in the early 1980s, believe it or not, when um, interest rates, you could get 12% on deposit at the bank. The bank would pay you 12%. Can you imagine that? 12% deposit at the bank. Mortgages were in the high teens, low 20s. That's what you paid for a mortgage. And the world just ticked along you're right it wasn't like high interest rate stops everything it's just it yeah. was a it was the normal at the time and i got involved with a uh, ground up multi-family sponsor and my job was to raise money for them i was their investor i didn't have the, i can't actually remember what my title was but uh it was probably investor relations i was investor relations and i raised in those days, I raised about 30 million, three zero, which in the 1980s was a lot of money. It's not so much uh, money today, but there was a lot in the 80s. And then there was a, and I actually thought I was, I, I actually, on paper, I was making millions of dollars because I was getting shares of each deals and whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I, I was in my tw mid 20s, William, seriously, a young fellow. It was making millions of dollars, spending every single penny of my salary on high living and Mercedes Benzes and fabulous whatever, uh, because uh, I figured I'm a rich man, so I don't need all this cash. I might as well spend it. And then what happened was there was a very severe downturn. It's called it's known as the savings and loan crisis, when hundreds and hundreds of financial institutions collapsed. Uh, and it wiped out the real estate industry. And I lost, basically went to zero. I actually went to negative. I actually was in debt, crying out. So I went from being a multimillionaire in my mid-20s, from nothing to being that, to in debt. And that was my first real exposure to how a sponsor can get it really badly wrong. Mm. Now, I wasn't at any time privy to what they were doing internally and i just you know i was just put in i was like uh you know i was just put in front of investors and told to explain slides that was my job basically i've come oversimplifying it but that is it i never really knew how they did their financing and uh, you know that that stuff so i didn't really understand how they how they failed uh in years after i did learn what it was that they did that caused them to fail but it was a very, very hard lesson for me. Not only did I lose all this wealth that I thought I had, but my career just came to a hit a brick wall. Mm -hmm. I left uh, and I went to Japan uh, where I started, uh, ended up working. I was helping my investors. So I raised money from Japanese investors uh, and I ended up working for uh, Universal Studios. So I built a, I was a, in charge of their, real estate across the region. So anyway, back to distress though. I came back in the early 2000s, did my own developments. And in um, 2007, the global financial crisis, I uh, decided to sell everything that I was working on. It's my entire portfolio. I was just, there was something I, I couldn't sleep at night. I was waking up at night with angst. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, I couldn't tell you then why. I just, I was, there was something going on, made me uncomfortable. And so I just thought, I'm getting out of this business. And I sold everything. So I had a, I had cash. Uh, and then the market collapsed. 
And one of my investors that had made money because I sold right before the market collapsed uh, was on the board of directors of a major bank that had done a uh, huge amounts of lending uh, uh, collateralized by real estate. And he brought me in to the bank because they had all these loans that were no longer, they're called not non-performing loans. So people mm -hmm. had stopped paying on the mortgages. And so the bank wanted, really needed saving. I mean, it's, it sounds a bit grandiose, but that was the bottom line. They, they were on the verge of collapse. Stock had gone from $40 a share to three. Uh, and they, they looked like they were going to collapse. And so my job was to look at this portfolio of non-performing loans, all collateralized by real estate. No, no single families, all commercial real estate. So in California, five units and above. I don't know if maybe that's nationwide. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, five units and above, all commercial real estate, and uh, to sell the notes. So what that meant, the, the loans, right? So you sell the loan to an investor. And so I ended up getting into the weeds of a lot of these deals. Like, how did they go bad? What did the sponsor do wrong? Mm. Uh, you know, how are the how is the sponsor acting now? with the bank like what are, like how are they communicating uh, with the bank and i dealt with thousands of investors now these were not individual investors william these were professional real estate investors at the time uh, that you 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 couldn't do general solicitation you couldn't raise money from individuals well you could but you had to know them you couldn't do online marketing right. um and so i learned every possible way that a deal can go wrong uh across just about every single asset class you can imagine big box warehouse type uh stores to uh you know hotels I actually ran a hotel for a weekend hmm. we foreclosed on a hotel this is a trip and a half right so you foreclose on something now you're the owner well it didn't occur to me until we actually had to foreclose on this hotel that oh my goodness i'm gonna have to serve muffins and change <laughs> muffins and coffee and change sheets if we take this thing over not me personally but we got to run this thing until we find a buyer for it so that was an that was a trip and a half as well how do we do that uh -huh. uh, for a bank so i went through just about everything you can imagine and saw every possible way deals can go wrong uh and uh, just to cut it short i ended up at colony capital and they'd done seven billion of acquisitions of non-performing loans uh, with the FDIC, but that's a different story. But that's how I understand what distress is. And it also involved uh, doing workouts as well. So I I, I ran a, a fund uh, where we looked at doing workouts, actually acquiring bad loans, non-performing loans, and doing workouts. And those are incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. so very, very challenging. You've got to know what you're doing. I so, say, you know, great topic for you to invite somebody on the podcast like an attorney or a receiver uh, or a service, a master servicer or something, uh, and ask them, all right, what's involved if you buy a non-performing loan uh, on, a, on a, a real estate, you know, on a multifamily deal here in Dallas, what should I be looking for? Like, what are the, what are the, how do I get to the real estate? Now I own the loan, but how do I get to the real estate? That would be mm -hmm. a great topic. Uh, for a for a, an expert in the area i mean i can answer that now but we've not got you know hours and hours and hours but that's basically so anyway that's my story that's awesome so what's been your favorite part of of this this journey um entrepreneurialism i would say becoming an entrepreneur yeah up until throughout my career other than when i did my own development um uh, i've i've worked for very large uh shops uh, for, for sponsors uh for institutional capital uh you know universal studios they were owned by seagrams at the time paramount was the co-venture partner they were owned by national amusements so these were publicly traded companies and th they were interesting it was interesting to learn to be a very very senior but still line manager where you've got you know huge teams of people who work for for me worked for me i built these large teams to build these entities and to develop and do what we did but i also reported upstream as well so i was technically a line manager right um 
And that was also interesting to learn how to be a really good line manager. Peter Drucker, uh, the effective executive, he's a very famous economist. He wrote a book called The Effective Executive. Uh, and uh, so I learned to be an effective executive in a you know kind of corporate environment. But the most thing, to, the coolest thing for me has been building this business that I have now. And you know what I've discovered, William? Actually, I really enjoy. I used to, I used to think very cynically of people who like to say, "Oh, I love helping people." But no, you're in it for the money. Don't like. What are you? Who are you kidding? And some people are really, I think, transparently that way right i like to help people no they don't they're just in it for the money what i've discovered about me is i that is what i really really enjoy doing most like talking to you and 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 encouraging you to don't give up on the podcast it's very powerful it, you've already done the hard work of figuring out how to record how to edit how to distribute how to put it up on your website all these things that for somebody who's never done it before are really at the outset unsurmountable challenges to get a podcast up. You've done that. You've done the hard work. So to encourage you to continue doing that, whether you do or not, it doesn't matter. Maybe you'll take it away. You'll decide to do it. Maybe you won't. It doesn't really matter. But I really enjoy sharing those insights and helping people on their paths to success. Oh, and you know what I also like to say? You know, this. Uh, you, you get what you pay for. Right, you get what you pay for, and my advice is free <laughs> <laughs> on this podcast. So, what can yeah, I tell you? Take it or leave it. That's so funny. Yeah, it's definitely it's free for listeners. You know, not free for me. Um, but anyway, uh, so well, that's not, pretty just funny. To be clear, he's not paying me, dear listeners. He's not paying me anything to do this. By the way. I'm not I'm sure what he's talking about. Anyway. No, no, right. no. So you're talking about time, right? The time. Yeah. Exactly. The time thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, it's been great to have you today. Um, what's what's one more piece of advice that you could leave for the listeners? So what I recommend is, uh, look, uh, the, the, the journey to successful real estate investing, whether you are a, a passive investor, you've got a, you know, a day job, or you're a professional real estate investor is all about education it's i mean basically life is about education and learning constantly and growing and becoming the, a better you all the time so if you want to learn more about real estate investing about syndication about what's going on in distress today and how to benefit from that how to you know participate in discounted deals uh sign up to my newsletter it is free uh, it, uh, gowercrowd.com that's my last name g-o-w-e-r crowd.com gowercrowd.com there's a big red button that says subscribe and um, we put out an educational newsletter every wednesday uh, and it covers uh, all the latest news in syndication and crowdfunding commercial real estate world there's some commentary and occasionally we do have some uh, really specifically educational pieces but it's it's really good so that's what i would recommend it's awesome. Adam, it's been a pleasure to have you today. Pleasure's all mine. William, thank you for having me. Like and subscribe below. A new episode will air every Tuesday at 7 a.m. Are you looking for more content? Visit our website, biggerpictureholdings.com. And remember, money really does grow on trees.